Okay. So I just, um, for anyone that's here that's new, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Kate Brown. I'm a program associate in commercial agriculture with Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Burlington County. My supervisor, Bill Bamka, and I started this program just over a year ago, and we host these monthly lunchtime webinars focused on homesteading topics. And today we're very fortunate to welcome Professor Jason Grabowski. He's been a professor of urban and community forestry with Rutgers um, since 2006 or so. And wow. he's a very prolific teacher and has very high ratings on Rate My Professor. So I'm very excited to hear from him and um, he can share his stories of home heating with all of us. So wow. Jason, go ahead and share your slide. Yeah. We shall scroll down. We'll see what we have. So here's screen one. Share that. Okay, is everybody everybody seeing the slide at this point? It looks good. And I just wanted to tell everyone that if you haven't been to these webinars before, we like for everyone to post their questions in the chat as they come up. And then I think we'll have plenty of extra time at the end. So yeah. maybe we can also have people um, you know, unmute and participate in the conversation. Um, Jason definitely has, uh, as we said in the title, you know, 50 years of experience with this. So uh, definitely take this opportunity to ask your questions. Yeah. Um, so the the big rule here is this is your time and thank you for giving me some of your time. Um, so if you have questions, break in. We have, um, I want to say, 326 slides to run through. Um, actually, there's 18 slides. Um, we're going to move a little slow because today I'm moving a little bit slowly. Um, I'm very happy that we have snow outside my front door right now, and I'm running my pellet stove um, at about 70% its capacity, and we've got a fireplace upstairs that's uh, boiling away nice and slowly. So we've already started our heating season. So let's see here. Let's get over to the correct screen. There we go. So I started this a long time ago. Um, this is a picture from the late 1960s, actually 1969. And there my father is teaching me how to read tree rings on a piece of firewood. And I was, I'm the little guy on the right. And um, I was enthralled. Um, little did I know that within weeks, this lesson was going to turn into how to stack firewood. And if I was going to get allowance, I was going to make sure there was wood in the house to heat the house. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> we use we used to use a fireplace. We went to a wood stove down in the basement. We outfitted the inside of the wood stove with a network of pipes. So we heated our hot water heat um, in those pipes um, and moved it through a house that was built in the 1750s. Um, not the best system, but in the 1970s, we thought we were up to big stuff. Um, you'll find most of the systems nowadays are water jackets exterior to the firebox. A much smarter design, especially when you get pinhole leaks in pipes that are constantly heated by fire. Um, but in any case, I've been doing this for a while. Um, and again, Please break in with your questions. Uh, let's make this a comfortable conversation. This is your time as much as it's my time. So where I live is in upstate New York currently. Uh, there's a little red pin drop there just off of Syracuse in the upper right corner. Uh, this is a hardiness zone 4B. Um, we reliably get to negative 20 Fahrenheit every winter. Uh, last winter was a little bit warm. We only got to negative 19, and I was very disappointed. Um, I use about four and a half tons of wood pellet. I use a premium hardwood pellet in my pellet stove. I happen to have a Harman. I think it's a pretty reliable brand. Um, I tend to spend a little bit more money for quality because parts wear out, and getting a better quality stove, I have found usually lasts a bit longer and the replacements I can do. Um, I use about 12 face cord of firewood. We'll talk about what a face cord is in a moment. Um, it's a standard firebox, but we have a fan insert into that firebox. So we actually get a lot of air circulation coming through. 
we also get a secondary burn on the the gases coming off of the fire using that fire insert so you go from a 30 to 40 percent efficiency up into the the high 70s uh, for the kind of stove that i have um this year you know i'm um i'm going to spend almost two thousand dollars for the benefit of heating with firewood and and pellet um up here we can go over three thousand dollars in heating oil for the house that i have um so we're actually saving money pretty well interestingly enough i noticed in 2002 when pellet stoves really started coming online we saw a doubling in the price for wood pellet per ton um and it's never come down they said they said there was a supply shortage we've made up for the shortage but the price never really came down and part of that's because we ship a lot of the pellet in the united states over to britain um, for their fire market um it would be really interesting in new jersey as we lose trees to say emerald ash borer if we could find a way of building uh, a, uh, a supply chain local to New Jersey to take trees that are lost by New Jersey pests and turn them into something other than um, a compost or a uh, urban fill, an urban waste product. So first first big piece that i want to mention and you folks are not talking enough so please break in please do not be polite because that never makes a conversation easy if only one person talks so please break in um i put this chart up here uh, wood is heavy um and we have a listing here on the left we have woods that would be considered really good firewood species in the middle are your moderate and strangely enough soft woods we typically do not use so much for wood heat um simply put um it is lighter as far as poundage per per cord um but it doesn't throw as much heat and with all the pitches you have to handle soft woods uh with aging a little bit differently uh you'll see that there are things like catalpa in the soft wood uh, aspen or the poplars in the softwood, even butternut in the softwood. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is that you have to use a lot more wood in order to get the same amount of heat. We typically like things such as black birch. We have a lot of that in New Jersey. Uh, a lot of the hickories work quite nicely. Um, a lot of people like red oak. I'm not a big fan of red oak. Um, it burns quite well, throws a decent heat, but splitting red oak by hand, um, getting it to split the first time can be a real pain in the neck. Um, once you release the internal tension in the wood round, wood splitting, it gets a lot easier, but I would much rather split sugar maple. I would much rather split ash and and birch than i would uh oak it just tends to tie itself together a little bit more um this is a list that i pulled off off of an online sheet uh the problem with some of these sheets you can see in the let's see you can see my uh, cursor here the words hornbeam ironwood and blue beech in some circles, those are all the same species. In other circles, there are three different species. So the common names get to be a little bit difficult here. Um, but, you know, we typically like looking at, at oak. We like looking at white ash. Notice that green ash still sold as ash in your market. You can have a very different experience if you're getting a green ash supply where you're getting less than 20 million BTUs per cord versus white ash um that's a big difference you know you're you're jumping almost four points per cord um that that's the difference between burning 10 cord of wood and 12 cord of wood all right so so what we ought to do is start talking about some of these terms okay and I keep using the term cord and BTU so BTU is just a, a thermal unit 
For our purposes, it just gives us a way of comparing the, the heat throwing capacity of the wood. When we use the word cord, a cord is a formal measure that's four foot wide by four foot tall and eight foot long. Okay, about 128 cubic foot. And that's when it's split and it's stacked. And so I use these images of, of these things that you can buy at Tractor Supply or L.L. Bean, or you can make them on your own. But they're four foot long. I mean, they're eight foot long. They're four foot high. And it gives you a nice measure of a face cord. So a face cord is one stack. If the logs are 16 inches long, which fits most fireboxes, three of these stacks makes a full cord. So when we go up to the chart that I just showed you with millions of BTUs per cord, it's like saying three of these face cords. When you're buying your firewood, you want to be sure of what you're buying. Um, right now, it's costing me $65 to $75. <laughs> per face cord. Um, and a face cord is, is just that. It's the four foot by eight foot. Uh, you want to know if you're buying your wood by face cord, how long the wood is cut. It should be 16 inch. Sometimes it's 18. Some people will cut it longer. But you want to know that because if you've got a 14 inch firebox for a small house and you buy a face cord of wood and it's all cut at 16, you got a lot of work cutting everything up in order to get it into your stove. So you want you, you do want to make sure you know what you're buying, not just the species of wood. That would be handy. Um, but what you want to do is know what is the cut length. Um, that's getting to be standardized in the past 20 years or so. Um, we have a lot of people that have gotten into this business and they have specialized machines with, which lays a log onto a track. You pull the cover down and there's three or four chainsaws positioned at 16 inch intervals so they can cut multiple pieces at a time, run it down and split it as it's coming out of the machine. Um, so you can, it's getting more standardized, but there are places and I've bought loads where they're all 12 inch chunks. Um, the thing is, if I'm getting those short chunks, usually I can talk to the person and I pay a lot less per face cord because I'm getting less volume of wood. So if you see something where everybody in your area is selling wood at a hundred bucks a face cord and you see in the newspaper, 50 bucks a face cord, I'd want to know how long the logs are. All right. Hey, Jason, there's some conversation in the chat about oh. cutting your own wood. Yeah. And, um, you know, different, we're, there's some discussion about a hydraulic splitter. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so, you know, cutting your own wood it, it is a very useful thing. Um, I used to cut a lot of my own wood. I grew up cutting my own wood. I'm getting of an age where I've learned that the aggravation expense more than worth paying to have it done with somebody out of a commercial operation. I get a more uniform product. Um, but if I'm going to cut my own wood, the first thing you need to do is realize that a chainsaw can be a bit of a, a dangerous tool. Um, so if you're going to be doing it, get trained on safe usage of a chainsaw. There are a lot of people out there that play with chainsaws. They think that they're doing work, but they're actually playing with a chainsaw. So get trained. They, they have safety manuals. They have safety uh, computer programs, video programs. Watch them, learn. Um, the thing is that um, when you have an accident, it happens in less than a second. Uh, when you get kicked back, you don't have the reaction time. So you better have a hard hat. You better have a face shield. You ought to have the safety glasses. You also have to have the hearing protection. And you should buy the Kevlar pants so that if the saw hits your leg, it doesn't cut your leg off. It only damages you severely, but it doesn't necessarily kill you. Um also, um, it depends on the trees that you're cutting, the safety 
in 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 dropping trees. So there's there's a whole skill set in cutting your own wood. If you want to cut your own wood, realize that it's an investment of your time. And I would gauge what's the value of my time versus buying the the product. If I have my own wood lot and it's a therapy thing for me as a homesteader might. Well, well, then just make sure you get the proper training so you can be safe out there. Mm. Um, electric chainsaws have come a long way. Um, if I'm cutting stuff that's predominantly 8-inch to 12-inch, I might consider an electric chainsaw rather than a gas power. Um, but once you start getting up over 12 inches, the battery life, just my opinion, they, they, they seem to drain too fast for me to really feel good about them. On the previous slide, you discussed the importance of knowing the type of wood that you're planning to yes. burn. And yes. Alyssa had asked in the chat about resources to be able to identify the trees uh, in your lot. She has oh. apparently a 10 acre lot with uh, a little bit less than five acres of woods. And she's yeah. specifically asking about oak identification. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think probably the, the quickest, easiest answer to that, um, check out the New Jersey Forestry Association. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that they have some free webinars that, that a kid named Kieran Hunt uh, developed on identifying trees in the, in, in the forest. Um, Kieran, I, I claim full credit for Kieran. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't, but uh, he came out of our shop um, in, incredible at this as far as plant identification and very good at, at teaching people how, how to notice the things you need to notice to identify trees. Um, I'm, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yes. I thought it would be better if I just spoke. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a, a various amount of different oaks. So I know there's scrub oak, there's white oak, there's red oak. Um, how do I tell the difference of the different oaks? And I, cause I see here, they have different BTUs. Some are harder to split than others too. Well, yeah, I always think of red oak being kind of hard to split. Um, but so red oaks more often than not are going to have a thinner bark and you're going to tend to see lines on the trunk, um, uh, like a, a color patterning line in the younger bark, like 30 foot in the air. That's not always the case, but they tend to have thinner barks. The white oaks are going to have much thicker barks with deep crevices in the bark, unless they have a, a kind of shaggy whitish bark. Um, red oak group typically have darker colored bark, but uh, again, it's not always a rule. Um, the way that I would look is look on the ground, if you see a preponderance of leaves with really pointy tips on the leaves, it's a red oak. If there are rounded edges on the leaves, it's a white oak. Does that help you? Absolutely. I'll be sure to share some of the resources that Jason has mentioned and others have mentioned in the chat um, in the post webinar email as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there's. I imagine that you could go on to how to tell red oak from white oak on your Google machine and um, get something from, say, University of Virginia or NC State, um, or you, you know, go to one of the, the college websites where they may have some quick videos. And it, it's really not hard to start educating yourself on that. One more question before we yeah. uh, get going again. Ed was asking whether silver maple is considered a hardwood or a softwood. Oh, that's a soft maple. So hard maples, the, the hard maples that we're going to, to treat, <clears throat> um, almost everything we're going to find up here is going to be sugar maple. Uh, some people um, would say that we have black maple up here, um, and indeed we do, but it looks so much like sugar maple that most people identify it as sugar maple mistakenly. Um, so hard maple would be sugar maple. 
soft maple would be just about any other maple that you find in the state of New Jersey. Hey, Jason. Yeah. Hey, it's uh, it's Jay Ottinger, and I piped in on the chat a little bit, but um, I'm a board member of yeah. the NJ NJFA. Yeah. And uh, I would promote NJFA membership to anybody with a woodlot or that is considering doing anything like that. I'd also like to promote the Woodlands Steward educational program that the NJFA puts on in conjunction with uh, with Rutgers every year. Now, we had to cancel it this year uh, due to a lack of turnout. Uh, we only had eight people registered, and I think we need like a threshold of 15. But it's yeah. a three-day course. It's uh, it's held up in Stokes Forest at the, at the Y camp up there. And um, you, it, you sleep in bunk rooms. Um, you know, there's a male bunk room and a female bunk room. And you eat pretty well. Uh, camp cooks are pretty good. But you kind of, it's it's an immersive woodlands management training. Uh, you know, hour to an hour and a half. Um, the forest fire folks come in. Uh, there's a bunch of different uh, private foresters, uh, you know, consulting foresters that, uh, that, that speak. There's a number of people that speak from Rutgers um yeah we, it, it's it's a great program so new jersey or njforestry.org for uh, for the website yeah we were going to be mentioning that a little bit later on but now that we've covered it it is if you have your own woodlot and you're you're thinking about this that is a very good first step to to get in to to thinking about the management of your land um so, um, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of, of the uh, Woodland Stewards program. And actually, Kate and I were discussing that before we started the, the session about uh, about Woodland Stewards as well as the Environmental Stewards program, which I think is also a pretty capital program. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So with wood pellet i just put a picture of wood pellet up here usually you buy wood pellet by the bag or by the ton i buy it by the ton a lot of times you can get it delivered so you're not handling it twice uh, which is how i usually do it so i pay an extra 50 bucks to have it dropped right into my garage right where it sets um but you know you can hand stack it and you know go to any any of the bigger hardware stores you can usually buy wood pellet and go bit by bit um, somebody had mentioned wood splitters and with wood splitters, um, I do most of my mine with hand by hand. I just find it to be more satisfying to, to use the sledge and a wedge, uh, because I'm only doing 12 face cord at a time. Uh, that works for me, but if I have some really difficult pieces of wood, they usually get set aside every winter when I get a backlog, I either rent a, a hydraulic wood splitter or I borrow one from somebody and I spend a day getting rid of all the nasty ones. That's how I usually do it. Now, if I had, there's one here, where do we have it uh, going back? American Elm. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. American Elm. American Elm works pretty well as a moderate wood. The thing is, it is lousy to split. If you do run into American Elm, uh, just the cheap wisdom is wait until it, it's about five below zero before you try to split it by hand. With with a hydraulic wood splitter, it's not a problem. Um, you can spend over $2,500 for a good hydraulic wood splitter. Um, if you have a lot of really nasty wood with difficult branches and splits, or you have a lot of elm, you might want to buy one. It will pay for itself over about 10 years. Uh, but that you know that's that's a cost of entry that's pretty high. You may want to split by hand for a couple of years, um, just to make sure that you're really into the wood burning habit. You may find that a pellet stove works a little bit better for you, namely because you have less wastage. You usually have a more efficient burn, and you have a little bit more control over how that heat is moving through your house. Uh, just in comparison, um, I have backup hot oil heat. 
uh, heating oil works really well in that it's a really high efficient burn. You know, you're over 95%, 97% efficiency, but it is a little bit expensive. Uh, I looked at central New Jersey for a 200 gallon minimum purchase, it's 550 a gallon. Um, so you can do that math. Um, basically for three face cord of good wood, it's going to cost you about $522. BTU for BTU with a decent wood. And again, I'm paying $65 to $80 for a face cord of wood. Um, wood's a lot cheaper, but there's also a lot more work to it. And it throws less heat as far as BTUs, and it's a less efficient burn. If you're going to, to do this and you want to heat your home, you're going to have to pay up front for a better stove so you get the more efficient burn so that, so that the math starts making sense. And so looking at some of the stoves, you can see that there's some really cool looking ones online for, you know, less than $700. Now, the thing is that those are relatively low efficiency stoves. By the When we start talking about the higher efficiency stoves, you're probably talking about inserts that can go about $1,000 to $2,000. Uh, there's some beautiful soapstone stoves that I'm showing down at the bottom here. And you can see those prices are going from almost three to $5,000. The older stoves are usually in that 40% range because it has the firebox, but it's not getting a secondary burn on the gases coming off of the primary burn of the wood in the firebox. And so for that recirculation and for that more efficient burn, you're going to have to pay for more mechanics in the stove. So you go from those old simple cast irons into something that's a little bit more sophisticated. What um what about the ones at Tractor Supply, like the Forester ones? Okay, I don't know exactly what the Forester ones are. Okay. Um, I, I but what I would want to know is if it's got a secondary burn, if you can get an efficiency status on it, do a little bit of research online. Um, quite often what I found, um, I bought a, a stove out of tractor supply several years ago, um, several being about 20. And um, I ended up replacing that that stove with a Harman stove and spending the more, more money because I kept having fans give out. I kept having, I just kept having small problems. That was with a pellet stove, not with a Forester stove. Um, so I just changed out. I got a better stove and I'm much happier and I have much better control over my burn. Um, but it, it's really just about taking a look at the stove and making sure that you can get that secondary burn. Um, and you can look online, get a tech spec for the stove. You should be able to find what the efficiency rating is for that stove. Thank you. Now, pellet stoves, like I said, I, I'm kind of happy with the one I have. The downside with the pellet stove is that you need to have reliable electricity, which if the power goes out, your pellet stove goes out. And that's not necessarily a good thing unless you've got a backup generator and you slave the circuit to your pellet stove onto your backup generator. Uh, but if you have reliable electricity... Uh, wood pellet gives you a, a very high efficiency burn because it is so dry. Um, there is very little wastage, and so you have less mess management of your ash. And you, you have less fussing over the fire interior to the house. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, be, because, uh, excuse me, you have less, because you're moving less ash, you don't have dust and stuff moving all through your house. So it's a little bit cleaner to your house, a little bit easier to move the wood in and out because it's in a bag. Um, and it's just generally easier for everybody in the family to handle it. At least that's what I have found with my children over the years. Um, the downside, um, Again, it, it, it's the electricity. Um, you put a 40 pound bag into the hopper, you can walk away for the day. You don't have to mess around with the fire. 
uh, fireplace insert. You're feeding it periodically through the day. A big wood stove. You can actually stack the wood inside the wood stove, light it, and let it go all day. Um, toward that end, we have a product that seems to be coming online, these wooden bricks that you see in the center. Now, the wooden bricks and the wood pellet are basically the same thing in different dimensions. They are a wood dust that gets compressed and heated. In the heating during compression, the lignins become a gluing agent, as it were, and holds that thing together. So they're hard. They work really well. If, if this stuff gets wet, it blows apart and it's a mess and it's pretty useless. But if you can keep the stuff dry, um, they work really well. The difference between the pellet and the brick, the bricks, you can put them in a wood stove and you do a dense pack in the back. You put a little bit of air in the front in a loose pack. You light the front and that thing can burn all day. Um, with the pellet, you put it in the hopper, and there it drops down, and it augers into a very small firebox and works through the day. One of the nicer things with a wood pellet, um, it the the box does not get as hot, and the the venting, the chimney effect for a pellet stove, is a lot simpler than for a traditional fireplace. Uh, with the heating bricks. It's really a function of the stove that they're burning in, whether or not you've you've got special venting or not. But uh, typically, it's not that bad. And with a wood stove in a house, we have enough piping systems that you can keep the pipes safe to touch. But a wood stove can get really hot, um, so so there's a safety consideration. Whether you use the the wood pellets in a really tiny firebox or you use pressed bricks in a traditional wood stove, or you use split firewood in your wood stove, it's all about surface area. And so big chunks of wood are going to burn slow. They're going to molder overnight. They won't throw as much heat, but they'll throw over a longer period of time. You split the stuff up really small, you're going to be able to get things burning faster. You're going to get things burning hotter, but you're going to be tending that fire more and more often. But it's simply a fact of surface area. And so here's where I was going to mention, you know, hand splitting to me, I like doing that. I learn a lot about wood by, by splitting it by hand. Um, I also take out aggressions after usually when I, I grade a midterm exam, I split a lot of wood just to get the energy out. Uh, the one thing about the hydraulic wood splitter, uh, there is maintenance on it. it. It moves very quickly. It's less taxing on your body. But when things go sideways, uh, you can really hurt yourself with a wood splitter. Um, for instance, I was, I was splitting a, a while back and you just get into a rhythm and you move the chunk over, you put the, the you, you put it in line, you pull a lever, the hydraulic piston puts like 5,000 PSI down on a wedge that pushes it through the wood. It breaks, you pull that off, you spin it, you, you pull it up, you pull it back. You know, there's just a process. Um, I was in the middle of lowering when something caught my eye off the corner of my eye. When I turned my head, I literally moved my shoulders with my head that moved my finger about a quarter of an inch. And I put a 5,000 PSI wedge through the center of my thumb. Um, it happens. Um, it's not fun. Um, I still have the thumb, uh, but it took a lot of duct tape holding it together until we could get it to some place where we could make sure that it stayed on my finger. Um, Splitting by hand takes a little bit more energy, but it also slows things down a bit. And to me, that's a valuable thing. Uh, you do want the wood to be dry. And I'm sorry, um, I'm not at my peak form here. I apologize for being a little bit dry. Uh, you need your wood to stay dry, um, not just because 
it's easier to light the fire. But if you start getting molds or you start getting fungi deteriorating your wood product, when you bring that wood into the house, you're bringing all those spores and all those molds, and it's going to impact the air quality of your house as you're bringing that wood in. Because if you're like anybody else I know, you're bringing in more than you need for the moment, so you don't have to keep running back and forth to your wood pile. You have a small stack next to your fireplace. So keeping it dry gets to be really important. And in almost every case, the wood that you split, if you're doing this on your own, you need to age that wood for a full season so that it dries down and it cures. Um, if you don't do that, you have so much hissing and so much energy being used in moving those fluids into a gas phase that you're lowering your energy output. But also a lot of those are going to go up the chimney and form creosotes and pitches in the chimney. And it makes a mess out of your chimney that you have to clean, number one. It can be dangerous if those creosotes build up. Cheapest, easiest thing to do is to cure your wood for a year before you burn it, which means if you're going to be heating with wood, <coughs> make sure that the wood is dried and that it's cured. If you're going to buy it, I would buy it in the spring so you have all summer to cure it before the fall. But if you're doing your own, make sure that the first year, you know, you get a good supply of standing dead or wood that, that's kind of already drying and get next year's crop put in too. So now you can start a rotation so that, you know, the wood is decent and dry. Um, that just works better. Very few people actually do that successfully. But if you can get your stuff in early in the spring, get it undercover, get it. You want to stack it so that it's, it's a solid mass and doesn't fall apart, but you want air moving through that wood pile to get rid of the moisture in the wood. You do need air circulation in your wood stack. So you, you stack it, you, you keep it out of the rain, you let it dry for several months, you're probably okay. The only, only, only exception to that rule, which is fortunate for those of us with ash trees, you can cut down an ash tree, you can split it, and you put it in your fireplace. And if you can get the stuff to burn, um, it's not going to throw a lot of creosote. So you don't have to do the curing, but you do have to do the drying. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody on the chat recommended a moisture meter and I just started to use one a couple of years ago. I've been cutting and splitting for 40 years yeah. and, and I highly, highly recommend it for 20 bucks. You can get a moisture meter that, and watch out, they're sharp. Um, well, it, yeah, you got to drive it in there. <laughs> yeah. It's well, actually not that far. Um, and you can, you can test it with your finger, you know, you about 30%. 30 to 40 percent water uh, moisture, but I highly recommend it. Very cheap, very uh, very effective. Well, and, and it, you know, Jay, that's a good point because it, it also gives you a certain amount of confidence and peace of mind. Um, you know, don't trust me. Trust this measurement. Um, it, it's a very useful thing. I actually had some uh, some wood a couple of years ago that was only dry on one end. <laughs> And and I didn't realize that. And and so depending on how I stacked it to start it, some was wet and some wasn't, and I didn't know it. And you know, the moisture meter bore that out. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, so you know, there's so those are fireplaces and those would be interior to your house. And we, we're going to try to get to some safety here in a little bit. <laughs> Excuse me. But there's also the, these uh, units here where, where now we've got boiler units where you, you have a, a large wood capacity and you put that in, you get the fire started, and you have a heat chamber 
and you start heating water and moving that into a system. So it's kind of a boiler system. Um, these can be inside. The one on the left is built to be inside of a home. You can have them outdoors. Um, most of what I see out there is outdoors, but only because unless you're inside somebody's house, you're just not going to know. Uh, when you're converting from an older home where you've got hot water pipes and registers, this can be a really useful tool. Um, the idea is that you have your heating unit and then you have the water jacket built around the outside, um, which is what we ended up doing in the 1980s. We just had a wood stove and we custom fabricated a water jacket around the outside. Um, and voila, we had an interior wood boiler that uh, we're still using at my mother's house. Uh, was that about 35, 50 years now? No, 40 years. That, that one's been working pretty well for us. It's not nearly as efficient as these new ones, um, but it works. Um, the idea with these is basically you, you have your wood box, you have the combustion gases move down and you get your secondary burn. So you get a really high efficiency burn out of these systems. As you're getting that, there's water flowing through and you're pulling the heat off of the firebox into the water, you move that water around your house and then you get radiant heat from the water. And a lot of people love hot water uh, radiators. It's a different kind of heat, doesn't dry out the air the same way that forced hot air or even a wood stove is going to do for your house. Some people like having the wood boiler outdoors because it keeps all the soots, all of the all of the wood chips, it keeps all of that out of the house. But it does mean that somebody has to go outside every day and load the wood crib. And some people really don't want to do that. Hey, Jason. Yeah. Uh, sorry to keep interrupting you. No, that, that's um, fine, Jay. I'm I'm, that, I'm on like 60% like capacity today. So that, uh, oh, I appreciate that, the help. The last slide was a tarm. And that's actually we, what we had. We had a 192,000 BTU farm. It was the middle size they have. And we had it in a mechanical room inside our home. Yeah. And um, my in-laws lived with us. Uh, you know, grandma was in a wheelchair from a throat. So they were always on the first floor. And when we had the home renovated to accommodate us and our four kids, in addition to my in-laws, uh, we added radiant heat in the in the yeah. first floor, and the, the um you know the dogs love to lay on it. It's nice to walk around on bare feet, but it's really really a a, a very moderate type of heat. It really is great. It, it is. It, it, so so that combination, the wood boiler, the tarm wood boiler, and the radiant heat in the floor was great. Yeah. We also ran a. Um, I, I know this is a little bit of icing on the cake, but we also ran one and a half inch tubing to the water quality unit in our endless pool. So the endless pool was adjacent to the mechanical room, also inside, and um, it was set down into the ground. So the, uh, the, the water quality unit was a dump zone for the boiler. So if the boiler got too hot, it would turn on the water quality unit and very quickly take the heat off the boiler. Okay. Yeah, because you, you do have to have that ability. If um, where I live, we have a lot of very hard water. And so water quality gets to be really important in these. And, you know, I'm a big proponent some uh, of keeping these in a closed system, like in that radiant heat where once the system is sealed, it's the same fluid moving through over and over, unless you have to do that kind of a purge if you've got a temperature problem. Uh, some people like having a bypass going to their hot water tank. If it's a heat exchanger, I'm okay with that. But if you start moving fresh water through these systems, the wear is just such a headache that I don't know very many people that have an open system with this heating their their usable hot water with these systems because it, quite frankly you're if you've got hard water you're destroying your piping in a very rapid rate um jay have you found that to, to be the case 
We sold the property after 21 years of feeding okay. that wood stove, the wood boiler. And um, we had uh, the, the inspection found no issues with okay. any of the plumbing systems. So well, that's fantastic. So, yeah, um, we did have a uh, another heat exchanger. The uh, domestic hot water was a 120 gallon Wow McLean tank, basically a tank with a heat exchanger in it, and um, and and so it 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 was a closed system from the perspective of only you know only drawing additional water in. Yeah, when you uh, had to, to purge to some somewhere around. We, uh, I never had to maintain that at all. I never did oh, maintain yeah. it. So, yeah, I mean, just, I, I'm going back a ways, you know, where it was constantly fresh water going into those tanks. So it was just like a, any hot water heater in a high lime hard water system. You know, your hot water tank, you have to have the electrodes to to change out, and unless you're really on top of it, a wood boiler goes faster than. Of a typical hot water tank if you're dealing with hard water hmm. yeah no we never had any issues okay yeah and i love the radiant heat idea because that's a closed system and it is it's very very uniform um just make sure that you pay attention to getting the radiant system incorrectly i would suppose now when we, when we start thinking about you know there's the fire box but then you have to get rid of the smoke you have to you you have to move those gases off and so everybody has their own codes but when we look at a chimney basically you have your firebox and an insert basically lines that and adjusts the flow right in here of the throat of your chimney and this is where you can get that secondary gas exchange if you've got a really good system or it pulls it around and brings it around the sides of the firebox but then you're going to have your exhaust come up. This is a little trap door that opens and shuts. So if you have no fire, you close this. So you, you close off the chimney, but you have to have that full on open or damped, moving it partial in order to maintain the airflow going up and out through the chimney. The chimney has to have enough lift to draw those gases, draw that exhaust out of the fireplace. When it's not in operation, of course, cold air is going to drop down and then heat up and, and go back up the chimney. <clears throat> That's why you have the you have a seal on the throat right here with that damper so, so that you can close that off when you're not actually using the, the fireplace. A lot of your spots are going to have a, a hole in the base of your firebox where your ash can go down, and then you have an external port on the outside of the building to pull the ashes out of the firebox instead of putting them in a bucket and carrying them through your house. Uh, not everybody has that anymore. So, you know, that's one thing that um, it, it really depends on the system that you're running. If you have a more modern unit and you're using piping, you, you pipe through, you build an insulated hole through your house. You can have single wall, which I do not recommend because that gets lightning hot. People get burned on that all the time. We're usually buying triple wall now. So you have three different walls. So you can actually, in, you know, in a moment of, of you're, you're starting to fall, if you touch that pipe, that pipe might get 80 degrees but it's not going to give you a third degree burn on contact, but it's three different layers of metal at, with gaskets on the inside and you get that dead air space that modifies the heat coming directly out of the firebox. It comes out of your house, it's going to turn roughly a 90 degree angle and then you're going to build loft to get that natural airflow pulling the exhaust out of the house. You're going to have a trap door on the bottom, and that's where you can pull the bottom out of this thing, and that's where you can collect ash that gets into that chimney, and then with a brush, you can just ramrod a brush down the whole straight shoot away and push everything out of the pipe. The pipe usually, as I said, has three different walls with different gaskets, so these pipes get rather expensive, but it's well worth it because, A, there's a safety aspect to it, and it gives you an efficiency. You're not losing quite so much out of the system. 
The idea is that, that you have the draw going up the pipe and it's literally pulling your exhausts up that pipe and up and out of the house. Now, some places it doesn't work that well. And you also may be in a house where you inherit a less than optimal chimney where it, it's bending and it, it's moving back and forth. Every time you make a turn, you're going to be losing velocity and that makes it harder for the venting to work. Uh, what what I found, I had a really rough time in Pennsylvania at one point with a house where I just could not get the chimney to draw. And we ended up buying one of these pizza oven vents, which I think work phenomenally. You basically seal over the top of, of the, the flue pipe at the top of your chimney. You put the, this, this mechanical fan in. You've got the vent top. You run the wires down and right next to your fireplace you can actually build a mechanical draw up the chimney. You start your fire and you actually get some really good control over the, the speed of your fire, the intensity of the burn by, by moving and toggling your vents, your, 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 let me get back here. Uh, if this is closed, you you have dampers here where you can let more or less air in at the, the base of your firebox. So toggling those dampers with the speed of your vent, you can actually dial in the, the quality of your fire very well. Um, if you're having any problems with draw, I really do suggest that you look at one of these vent pipes. It makes things a little bit easier. Um, and it comes, you you take a couple bolts off of this, it folds up like, like a hood, so you can still get, get your brushes down and clean your chimney. <clears throat> With any system, there's going to be wear and there's going to be an element of safety. You have to have, and, and Jay, you probably know the law in New Jersey better than I do, but, but typically you have to have a minimum non-combustible floor whether that, that's a brick plate or whether you get a heat shield, but you have to have your stove on a non-combustible floor surface. You have to have a minimum distance from any wall, and you have to have a protection on that wall from heat. Uh. So, and then you have to maintain that to make sure that that thing holds up and it is solidly mounted. You have to make sure that you have good sealing on your pipes so you're not effluxing stuff into your house, either where it goes through the wall or as the pipes join into each other or where they go into the actual stove. The store, so, yeah, go for it. So I looked into this because uh, I, I mentioned in the chat, in our current house, we had a masonry chimney and it had voids, so they, they wouldn't let us burn at all. And when I was looking at putting an insert in, um, I was looking at close clearances in some places. And yes, this minimum clearance drawing that you show uh, should be available for just about any appliance that you go and buy it nowadays. The most important thing, in my opinion, is that if you, if you cut any of these short, which you can do with proper heat shields, but the heat shields must be UL listed. They must be underwriter laboratory listed. And uh, I, that's one of the places that I would never cut corners. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a, a problematic flu and I, I was able to use an insert. And I think that that's the, you know, that, that's a good stopgap. But eventually, you know, if, if there's cracks in the chimney, it means you already had some heat escape. You've already got deterioration in the chimney. It's probably putting off a major repair, but it's not going to avoid a major repair. So if you if you're in the business, you know, so if you have to put a liner in, I wouldn't call that your ultimate solution. I think that that's buying you time until you can figure out your next configuration when you repoint the chimney and and you know replace that flue. Uh, just over time, um, I've never seen. I've never seen it go more than 15 years with, with a good insert. But I have seen chimneys last a very long time properly maintained. Um, with the doors, you're always going to have some backing that you're going to want to inspect every year. 
and you may want to plan on replacing that every three years um, until an inspection says, no, you can wait a year. But, but just by opening, closing, you're going to start moving the shape of this. It's going to start holding its shape and stiffening, and then you're going to start getting air gaps in the door, which is going to affect the efficiency of your burn. Usually, <clears throat> you'll notice that there's a problem when you start getting a lot of ghosting or staining or pitching on your on the windows of your stove. That means that air is getting in a way that really wasn't meant to go. Uh, basically, you take this and chip all of this out. You get a new rope seal with some new sealant. You go in, you clean the thing, then you put new glue in, you put a new rope in, and you're good to go. Uh, ropes are different sizes, so you want to make sure you get the right sized sealant for the groove in your door. Um, but almost every door is going to have something like that, so you're going to want to look at that for almost any of your traditional fireplaces. You got to clean your chimney. It's a pain in the neck, but you have to do it. What happens is if you get a really high combustion inside the chimney, the flue pipes are going to shatter and break. If it happens a second time, that flame is going to escape right out of those cracks. And, and the heat that builds up in that chimney is going to light surrounding materials like your roof. You really don't want this to happen. So you have to have the right sized brush every year you're going to make sure that you can brush that chimney keep it clean using dry wood cured wood is really important you can buy the anti-creosote uh, spray that can work quite nicely some people like buying the anti-creosote logs if i'm heating my home those logs are too expensive so i would actually buy the chemical and spray a couple pieces of wood as I'm building a fire in the morning. Well, that works a lot better. And it gives you that, it, it starts powdering out some of that creosote so you can drop that, that brush down and get that stuff out of your chimney in a more efficient manner. And, and the brushes are not that, that expensive, and the pieces are not that expensive, but the safety is really important. If you're going to get up on your roof, make sure that you're attached to something so you don't fall off your darn roof. And so you can see that if you're hiring a professional, they're going to have to have a full body harness. They're going to have to be tied in before they go on your roof and do the brushing. Um, if you don't like heights, it's well worth it to have a good chimney sweep that's professional that will give you a rated job and they carry their insurance to make sure that they do their job appropriately. Otherwise, you're going to have to have a really good mirror and you're going to have to be able to look up and down your chimney. So you'll open up the base of your chimney, you put a mirror in there and you can shine a flashlight down and have the light flight flash, the light flash go back up to you and you can see the sides of your chimney to make sure that you got a decent clean. Also, get yourself, spend the money, and get a high-quality uh, vacuum that's not going to catch fire if you happen to get a live coal into the vacuum cleaner. Um, you think about that, it's moving a lot of air fast. So if you get a live coal, it's going to light really quickly inside of a vacuum canister moving air at high speed. So get yourself that and, and keep your stoves clean. The last fire of the year, get everything out, vacuum it thoroughly, brush it a second time, knock on it, make sure that all the orifices are open, vacuum it again, drop into the base. If you've got a pellet stove, you've got to pull the shrouds off. You want to vacuum each of your fan components and go through all the way up to the chimney. You got to get all of the ash out. Otherwise, it's going to sit there with humidity. It starts corroding the metals inside your stove. So you want to keep yourself incredibly meticulously clean in the off season. You want to be cleaning regularly in the on season. Hey, Jason. Oh, yeah. Uh, just, just one thing. And, um, I, I know you're going to take this with a grain, but, um, the uh, the paper 
bags that you can put in a regular shop vac for drywall dust are very effective for ash also. Yeah, now, as the, long the as caveat, the caveat there, and I know you'll agree, the caveat there is you got to make sure there's nothing live. You got to make sure the ashes are cold. Yeah, and that's it. If you're cleaning a stove, that uh, a fireplace insert that's been out for two days with a deep bed of coals, um, you can have live coals two days out. Sure, sure. You know, no, no so, so you got to, you know, be very careful if you do that. And yeah, I, I've done that too, Jay, um, and I've used that. Um, I've also lit a shop vac on fire by accident. Um, and the embarrassment value, it, it isn't worth it. Just buy a good, <laughs> buy a good fireplace uh, vacuum because I, I don't know. Uh, humility can be bought, I suppose. Um, last thing, if you are going to go out and start harvesting, because Kate, we're out of time, aren't we? Okay, I'm just going, we'll make this the last slide. If you're going to cut your own wood, realize that chainsaws are developed specifically for certain sizes of wood. And a lot of people like buying a really big engine, a really big saw, because they think that it's more powerful and they get a really big bar on the saw. Doesn't work that way. A, different saws have a different range of bars. And what you want to do is if your saw is rated for a 16 to 22 inch bar, I'd get an 18 inch bar because the engine is the engine is the engine and you're pulling a chain around the distance of that bar. So an 18 inch bar has the chain moving faster at the same RPM as the, as a 20, it, the 18 inch chain is moving faster than the 22 inch loop chain on the same engine plant. So what you want to do is figure out how big are the trees I'm thinking I'm taking down, get the right size bar. Your bar ought to be 20% longer than the trunk. Can get down to 15, but you don't want to have a 12 inch bar for a 20 inch tree. You want a 24 inch bar for a 20 inch tree. So figure out what size you're going to be cutting get the appropriate size bar and the appropriate size saw to manage that bar, you want it to be in the mid-range of your saw. Get the anti-kickback chains. They're usually labeled green so that if something does go wrong, you're less apt to have the saw fly out of the log and into your face and get all of your, <coughs> get all of your safety gear. Once you do that, oh, once you do that, you do have the amount of wood in a tree. I can look at the height of the tree and the diameter at four and a half foot above ground, and I can estimate how many cords of wood I'm going to get out of the tree so I can make a chart of how many trees I've got to drop this year to be able to make my heating need for the following year. And so I give you this chart. This is recorded. You can look these charts up. But do the math on a really lousy day after your football team loses. Make sure you know what it is you're trying to get done the following year, and then you can make a good plan of work and then work your plan and work it in the spring so that the wood has a summer and fall to dry out. Thanks for your time, folks. Sorry it wasn't as high energy as usual, but there's some information. I hope it was useful. Oh, Jason, it was a wonderful presentation and excellent discussion. I am. Um... If you have time for it, there's two quick questions I go wanted to it. ask in the chat. Yeah, um, go for it. I understand people will have to jump off because people do use this as their lunch hour, but um, Wes was asking about recommendations for brands of pellet stoves or maybe what to look for in a pellet stove. What I want to look for is really good gaskets and really good controls on the side where I have either the ability to do manual adjustments or have it fully automated. Um, but I am i haven't been in the market for about 15 years, so I don't have a brand in mind. Um, I just happen to use a Harman and I'm happy with it. Okay. Uh, another question about recommendations for chimney sweep companies or what to look for in a chimney sweep company? Look for credentials, look for recommendations, 
look for longevity in the market. Okay. And one final question from Alyssa. Um, is there a first timer standalone to pipe chimney system? A first timer standalone. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> that's me. That's me. Um, yeah, no, no, I don't no. have a uh, a fireplace or anything, and that's yeah. why I was just looking to utilize to cut um, and burn uh, oak that's harvested from my property to yeah. supplement and heat my house, like a pedestal stove with a like a pipe going out of the side of the house because I don't have a chimney. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so again, if you get a really high efficiency stand stand up stove. Um, they're going to give you recommendations for the kind of pipe that you need in order to keep it safe and go through the your local laws as far as what has to be done. Um, a lot of those high efficiency stoves, you can get a, get away with a, a triple wall pipe, and they they will they'll tell you specifically what you need. And then most of these have gaskets with fittings, and you slide them on. You get the gasket to hit. You turn it. It locks into place and you put that chunk on. And what you do is you figure out, you know, what are the directions to get it out of the house. And, you know, that every single one of these people ha have their design guides. And then it's about, okay, these are our distances. And so these are the parts and they sell you the parts and it's basically click and snap and you put it through. The biggest challenge is safely boring a hole inside of your house to get the vent pipe out. When you say they, you mean uh, a company? Whoever you're going to yeah. companies? Yeah. If you're going to have a com contractor install it, that's the most difficult thing. Everything else is pre measured and put in. And it, it, it's not that hard. Um, if you're doing it yourself, cutting that hole is probably the, the most um, involved piece because cutting a hole through the side of your house, you know. That, that's not a small thing. You think a lot before you start the saw, as it were. But once you have that that access hole, everything kind of goes together rather quickly. And I would say an hour and a half online, once you know what kind of piping you're using, you can find design guides. You can find installation videos. Um, it, it's not that hard. It is a little bit uh, intimidating, but it's not that hard. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you everyone thank you. for contributing to the discussion. We are so thankful to have had Jason for this, and I will be sure to share the recording within a week when it becomes available. Uh, we would definitely appreciate you taking a couple minutes to take our post-webinar survey so we can get your feedback, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, folks. <laughs>